Six days in Jerusalem. A journey of the heart through Holy Week. Thursday. A reading from Psalm 55. My heart murmurs within me, and the terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling grip me, and horror has overwhelmed me. For it is not an enemy who insults me, that I could endure. It is not a foe who rises against me, from him I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion and close friend. We shared sweet fellowship together. We walked with the crowd into the house of God. Amen. So far in our journey this week, we have looked at the nature of the human heart. We have spoken about how the God of love may find a home there, and we have reminded ourselves of the great abundance of good fruit that an open heart and the indwelling Lord will bring forth. But of course this doesn't always happen. So today we turn our attention to what prevents this from happening and the great enemy of love, which is fear. It is fear that can reach out and choke the channels through which there should pour only love. Fear that can sow mistrust where there should be only friendship. Fear that makes us wary of others, particularly strangers, or people of a different culture, ethnicity or social class, and makes us suspicious of their interests and their intent. Now what makes fear so dangerous to love is that it is an outgrowth of something that is originally healthy, even loving. We should be careful about not falling from high places or about what plants we should eat or not eat. We should be careful about who our children play with, how we cross the road and whether we have saved anything for retirement. But being careful and prudent is acting rationally, while the sort of fear that I'm talking about makes us act irrationally. And the problem is that it's very easy to slide from one to the other. Jesus knows this only too well, and that is why he sought to reassure us in the Sermon on the Mount by saying, Do not worry. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storehouse or barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? So if you cannot do such a small thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory was adorned like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not be concerned about what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the Gentiles of the world strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added unto you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide yourself with purses that will not wear out, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Seek the kingdom, Jesus tells us. 
and these things will all be added unto you. Simple and easy advice to hear, but very difficult for we worrying humans to follow. And I do mean just as difficult for me as it might be for you. So today we will consider two case studies in fear. Judas Iscariot has been a disciple of Jesus since the beginning. He's listed among the twelve when they're first chosen by Jesus and commissioned. He's been on the road with Jesus ever since, shared in the adventures, the miracles, and witnessed everything that has occurred. The disciples have lived together. They've eaten and drunk and journeyed and slept in each other's company. Judas is, quite simply, Jesus' friend. And yet today, Thursday, Judas betrays Jesus. Does he do it for the 30 pieces of silver? Perhaps, but it seems to me that the price was agreed after Judas had already decided on betrayal. The Gospel of John states that Judas was the treasurer of the group and that he had been stealing from their collective purse. So perhaps the journey of fear starts with guilt. Now, if Judas is honest with his fellow disciples and with Jesus, he might then straighten the situation out. We know what Jesus would do if Judas ever asked him for forgiveness, but he doesn't. And then... There's a general disenfranchisement with the group. It's not going the way that Judas wants it to go. He sees Jesus' lifestyle, his seeming indulgence with people who are neither rich nor powerful nor influential enough to have anything to contribute to the coming kingdom. Why is expensive perfume going to waste when it could be sold and the money given to the poor? Perhaps Judas even wants Jesus to be more militant, more messianic. Perhaps he thinks, this is not what I signed up for. Now once again, being at odds with Jesus or the group, isn't this all something that Judas could straighten out in some way? Or even if he can't talk it through, just do the usual thing that people do if they find themselves in an organisation where they no longer agree with its methods or its goals, and simply leave. But fear compounds on fear, doesn't it? And it crawls into nooks and crannies away from the light. And once a person stops sharing or talking it through and gets into an irrational mindset, then they can do the silliest things. And what Judas decides to do is this, to go to the authorities and hand Jesus over. Perhaps Judas rationalises that they will just give Jesus a shock a kick in the seat of the pants and send him on his way. Perhaps Judas feels he's been wronged by Jesus and wants him to get some sort of comeuppance. Let's see Jesus ostracised for a while and see how he likes it. But either way, the whole thing, eternally driven by fear, gets totally out of hand and Jesus is not just arrested but dragged away to a shockingly quick trial and death. The fact that this was not what Judas was expecting to happen, even if it was the logical consequence of his action, is borne out by what happens next, when everything comes crashing down and Judas realises that far from hiding his guilt, his guilt is now seen everywhere. Instead of changing the direction of the group, he has now irreparably severed his connection with it and will never be respected by any other disciple ever again. And instead of rebuking Jesus, suddenly all the condemnation falls back on him. But fear is insidious. It gets so quickly into the human heart using the smallest of purchases and is so very difficult to eradicate. Consider Peter, the rock on whom Christ will build his church, and then his denial of Christ. It's not planned and considered like Judas. Instead, it's forced out in the moment when a wave of fear washes over him and he is recognised in the flickering torchlight outside Jesus' trial. But nevertheless, how can it be that the man who once said, even if all fall away on account of you, Jesus, I never will, and even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you, could go from that 
in the space of just one evening to, I do not know what you're talking about. I do not know the man. And even wildly cursing and swearing and repeating over again, I do not know the man. Only fear can do this. And that is the ever-present danger of fear. So how do we deal with fear? How do we stop fear from ruling our hearts and squashing the love that should really be there? It's difficult. Difficult even for the Son of God because fear can be extreme. But there is a way. And fortunately, in the course of that same Thursday evening, we see how. And there's no better example for us to follow than that of Christ Jesus, whose example has inspired courage in so many famous Christians in terrible situations over the years and centuries. We see it as witnesses to Jesus' lonely struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane with fear. Jesus is alone, his disciples asleep, no one to share his troubles with, no one to understand because only he knows what's coming. The future, all that the morrow entails, and after all, that is what fear is about. Things that might happen in the future lies heavily on his soul. But what does Jesus do about it? Does he lash out at others? It's your fault, God. You got me into this. No, he doesn't. Instead, he surrenders and he prays. He turns it all over to God and that is something that we should do also with each of our fears and worries and doubts. If you can, Father, Jesus prays, take this cup away from me. But if it is your will, then let your will be done. I pray that you will never know the grip of fear on your heart. But if you do, and perhaps at some times in our lives we all will, then I pray that even in the midst of the crisis you are able to turn your fear over to the Lord. For God's yoke is easy and his burden is light. He will take the fear from your heart and carry it himself to the cross. He will forgive all that you have done and are guilty about if you give them over to him. He will take your burden, and if even that is not enough, he will carry you, even to the end. And I pray, Lord God, that in every part of the world, and in every human heart, you replace fear with your great and infinite love in all its many forms. Love in place of guilt, love in place of condemnation, love in place of remorse, love in place of inadequacy, Love in place of worry and doubt. Love in place of violence and abuse. For your light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Come, loving Father, let your will be done in our hearts this day. Amen. Let's finish with some poetry. Across the Kidron Valley, where they met where times were blessed, lies a garden filled with olive trees where olive oil was pressed. Here the twelve would praise and sing and pray the night away, but tonight their light is dying and the darkness holding sway. Keep watch, Simon Peter, and you sons of Zebedee. Gethsemane, Gethsemane, Gethsemane. This night the heavens are weeping, as he once wept for the dead, though his friends can't keep from sleeping, for they know not what's ahead. And even angels strengthening cannot staunch the sweat that rolls, like the blood wells from a wounding, as he wrestles with his soul. Father, if you're willing, won't you take this cup from me? Gethsemane, Gethsemane, Gethsemane. Now temptation's hour is quashed by betrayer's angry band, led by feet so lately washed by the master's loving hand. And the master, once transcendent on the mountain top so bright, meets betrayer undefended 
meek as Paschal lamb tonight. I drink from this bitter cup the Father gives to me, Gethsemane, Gethsemane, Gethsemane. The kiss is made for mammon sealed by the one he still calls friend. A wounded enemy is healed as he loves us to the end. For he comes not in rebellion, though his legions fill the skies, but to show the way, abide with us, and open up our eyes. If you seek Jesus of Nazareth, know I am he, Gethsemane, Gethsemane, Gethsemane. Across the Kidron Valley, where the twelve once met to pray, lies a garden now in ruins where God's Son was dragged away. He was taken to another hill, and there he paid the price for our sinful human nature through his bloody sacrifice. He chose the Father's cup, and in choosing set us free. Gethsemane, Gethsemane, Gethsemane. God bless you from the loving heart.